Now your task is very similar to what you do for images. You, you have an entire graph as your input, and then you want to classify that graph. And then your data are gonna be multiple graphs. And for each graph, you have the ground truth. You have the ground truth label. So now you are operating at the graph level. So far we have been operating on the node level. We were classifying our nodes in a single graph. Now you're operating at the graph level. Let's take an image. Actually an image, you can turn it into a graph. And I'm gonna tell you how, and it's gonna give us some intuition of why we call this convolution. Something like an image or a video or a speech or text, you can put that on a regular grid. For the irregular domains, like social networks, brain connectomes or word embeddings, you can represent them by a graph or by multiple graphs. You have your graph, nodes, edges, and adjacency matrix. This is your node. You have n nodes, you have edges, and then you have your adjacency matrix. And then you can, I said that you can convert an image into a graph. How? Let's say you want to do three by three convolution. That's your kernel size. So let's say the size of this guy is three by three. So you have nine pixels in that window. The pixel in the middle is looking at eight other pixels. So it's connected to eight other pixels. So you can have eight nearest neighbor graph for your 2D images. So you can turn an image into a graph. How many nodes are you gonna end up with? You're gonna end up with 28 square because each node is gonna look at its edges, its, uh, its neighbors through edges, through connections. And then you have 28 by 28 pixels. And then at the same time, you need some fake nodes because as you do your convolution from one iteration to the next, from one layer to the next, and if you want to keep the same pixel size in the next layer, you need to do zero padding. And for those padded elements, you're gonna add some fake nodes in your graph. And then you're gonna have edges connecting them. And this is gonna be the number of edges that you're gonna end up with. Each node is gonna get connected to eight other nodes. In terms of your adjacency matrix, because in a convolution, it matters the distance between this point and this other point, it matters. And then maybe the further you go from this point, the less weight you need to associate to that relationship, that edge. Maybe it's a good idea to use a squared exponential kernel here. What does it say? The distance between two points, these are the actual coordinates. If they are far apart from each other, because of this exponential and that negative sign, their relationship is gonna to go to zero. So the weight that you're, the importance weight that you're putting on the edge between node i and node j is gonna to go to zero. The further these two points are apart from each other. And then for each pixel, you have a value. So for each node, you're gonna have the corresponding intensity of that pixel. It's a number from zero to 255. Whatever that you do, you're, you have a signal on a graph. And for instance, this could be an image. And your X, if you flatten it out, it's gonna be a vector in Rn. N is your, the number of nodes that you have in your graph. And the way that you interpret it, each element of that vector is the value at that node. So these are your pixel values. Now we want to do convolution. This concept, I introduced it in the in a framework that you know about, you know about images and you know that you can turn your images into graphs, but then you can extend this. You can go beyond images. You can go to social networks. You can go to gene data and biological networks, telecommunication networks like 5G. You can do text documents for word embeddings, etc. What we want to do is we want to introduce convolution. And we just saw that it has to do something with Laplacian. Let's see why. We introduced a degree, the degree matrix. It's a diagonal matrix, which is the summation of your weights, the rows of your adjacency matrix. Then the combinatorial definition of the graph Laplacian is what we just saw. It's D minus W. You can have a normalized definition, which is you're multiplying D from, you're multiplying L from left and right by D minus one half. So this is gonna be identity minus D minus one half W times d minus one half. And this is a normalized definition. Now you're starting to see why in the previous paper we were working with d minus one half w, d minus one half, okay? 
Now it turns out that L is gonna end up being a real valued matrix. It is symmetric and it's positive semi-definite. And for such matrices, you know that you have a complete set of orthonormal eigenvectors. So you can take a look at your eigenvectors and they're gonna give you a basis and they're gonna end up being orthonormal. So this is a typo. It has to be L equal to zero up until N minus one. So you have N of those vectors and you have N corresponding eigenvalues. And the cool thing is that you can actually sort them. These are non-negative and you can sort them according to their importance. U, you're gonna call it a Fourier basis. And this is where those ideas of those names spectral are coming in. You can take these vectors, put them in a matrix. You can take the diagonal of your eigenvalues, put that in another matrix, and then you can diagonalize your L, your Laplacian, your normalized, your normalized Laplacian. So what is the Fourier transform of a signal here? You take your X, you take an image, and if you multiply it by U transpose, that's gonna take you from the real domain into your Fourier domain. So X hat is now in your Fourier domain. And you can go backward by using U. U transpose is gonna take you from real to Fourier, and U is gonna take you from Fourier to real. And how do you define convolution? Why did you go through this trouble? Because we know that convolutions in the real domain are gonna to correspond to simple multiplications in the Fourier domain. So it's very hard to draw to define convolutions on graphs in the real domain, but perhaps if you go to the Fourier domain, things are gonna be much easier. And let's see why. So this is gonna give you convolution. You first go to Fourier domain, you have two signals, X and Y. You have a convolution over a graph. This is a definition. You take Y, you go to the Fourier domain, you take X, you go to the Fourier domain, and then you multiply them together. So it's a simple point-wise multiplication. Now you are in the Fourier domain, you need to go back with U, and that's gonna give you a convolution. And now you start to see why people call this convolution on graphs. And what is a spectral filtering? Because you want to apply nonlinear operations on your graph, and some good examples of nonlinear operations are polynomials. Let's say G theta is a polynomial, and you're parametrizing it somehow. And I'm gonna tell you how. If it's a polynomial, you can apply it on your L, on your normalized Laplacian. And because you diagonalized it, and because these are orthonormal vectors, you can take G and apply it on the diagonal term only. This is cool because now you can parameterize this G tilde, G theta function. How? For instance, one example could be you pick a vector, this is a vector of your parameters, you put it in a matrix. You diagonalize it, actually, you put that vector on the diagonals of a matrix, and then that's gonna give you some parametrized convolution now. What you have here is just the diagonal of a vector of parameters. There is a problem with this method. This is non-localized in the space because what you have here, what you're gonna end up here is gonna be local in the Fourier domain, but as you go back to the real domain, this is gonna end up being non-local. Basically, any pixel is gonna pay attention to everybody else on the image, which is not good, which is not what we want. We want things to be local. We want to have a small window. And there is another bigger problem. You have as many parameters as you have data points. Basically, N is the size of your data. So we want to be more efficient. We want to be more parameter efficient. So one idea is to use polynomials. And a good choice is Chebyshev polynomials. The way that the Chebyshev polynomials work is that you start from one X, and then in an iterative fashion, you're gonna create your higher order polynomials. The second order is just gonna be two X squared minus one. And then you keep doing that in an iterative fashion. These are gonna give you your polynomials. Now, rather than defining uh, your convolution that way and parameterize your convolution that way, we can parameterize it in terms of coefficients of these Chebyshev polynomials. Now you can have much less parameters. You can have K terms in your polynomials. So you can go up until polynomials of order K. And now you have K parameters, okay? We fix this problem. The learning complexity is now K. And what is this uh, gamma tilde? It's your original gamma. It's your 
eigenvalues is this matrix here divided by the maximum eigenvalue. So this is how we are going to define it. And this is just a normalization constant. We don't worry about it too much. We solve this problem and we actually solve the first problem as a byproduct. This is going to end up being localized in a space. And there is actually a theorem in the paper that proves that. So these spectral filters are provably strictly localized in a ball of radius k. So it's very similar to what you do for your image. We can think of k as your window size, as your filter size. In terms of graph, it's going to be k hops. The first neighbor, the second neighbor, the third neighbor, if k is 3. And then you have much less parameters. k is a hyperparameter that you choose. It's very similar to your filter size for your convolutions on images. And then why Chebyshev polynomials? Because it's going to be very efficient when you, this could be any polynomial, but why Chebyshev? Because they are going to be faster to evaluate. X is your image, and then you want to push it through a convolution. You take your Chebyshev polynomials, you multiply it by X, and then these are the parameters of your convolution on a graph. L tilde is very similar to gamma tilde, so it has the same definition. You're just replacing your eigenvalues by L. Now you can define this guy to be X, K, and this bar here doesn't mean you are taking a mean. It's just the name of your variable. It's going to give you XK. You use the definition of your Chebyshev polynomials down here and replace everything by XK. Wherever you have TK, you're, you're going to replace it by XK bar. Now you start iteratively. You start with your image. That's going to give you your X0 bar. You apply your L tilde. This is just a vector matrix vector multiplication on your x. That's going to give you your x1. And it's very similar to what you do for your Chebyshev. And then the rest of it is just iterations of this guy. It turns out uh, that the computational complexity is very similar to what you do for images, a convolution on an image. The number of edges is going to come in, and k is because you're doing an iterative process. This is the number of operations that you need to do. Not only you need to do convolutions, you need to do max pooling if you want to do convolutions on a graph, convolutional neural network. It turns out that it's actually not that trivial to do pooling operations on a graph. It's an NP-hard problem if you want to solve it. It means that you cannot solve it in polynomial time. But there are some greedy algorithms in the paper that tells you how you can do with the pooling operations. OK, in the end, let's apply this on the image data set. You can apply a classical CNN. This is the best CNN available. It's going to give you 99.33 in terms of accuracy. It's very high. For You can treat your images as graphs and then apply convolutional neural networks on graphs. And then that's going to give you this framework that we saw here. And that's going to give you 99.14. OK, perfect. In the previous paper, I mentioned these words. It's a first order approximation of a localized spectral filter on a graph. We saw what is an spectral filter. We just saw it. This is your spectral filter. And what is the localized? Or localized here, it means you're using these Chebyshev polynomials so that you end up with a K neighbors. So we covered those. What is, what is first order approximation? First order approximation is when you only keep the first two polynomials. So when you set your k to be one, and that's what it means by first order. So you're looking at your first order neighbors. So this paper and the next one is, are related. If you keep the first order, you're going to end up with a simple averaging. Okay, so far so good. 